morning. morning. Welcome to the worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Hobart, Indiana. My name is John Halstead. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I participate in the life of the church by serving on the board. Uh, For announcements today, uh, the worship committee will be meeting after church at 1230 here in the chapel. Do we have any other announcements? We are a religious community with diverse beliefs and shared values. Our diverse beliefs are expressed in our six sources, and our shared values are expressed in our seven principles, both of which can be found online at uua.org. Together, we strive to grow spiritually, build community, and live our values in the world. We are currently in search for a full-time minister, and when we do not have one in the pulpit, we invite members or guests to share a special message with us This is one such Sunday, and we are fortunate to hear from me. (laughs) I feel so fortunate. We are currently streaming our service online. The joys and sorrows portion of our service is, however, private, and we'll we'll take a break from streaming and recording during that part of the service. The sermon portion of the service will be recorded and available for future viewing on Facebook, YouTube, and the church website. Let your Facebook and Twitter friends know you're attending worship with the hashtag First Unitarian Hobart. Due to the increase in COVID cases and the more infectious Delta and Omicron variants, we ask that all in-person attendees of the Sunday service wear a mask covering both nose and mouth, unless you're speaking up here. You can either bring a mask or one will be provided to you, and we thank you for your your consideration of our community's health and safety. Please take a deep breath now and join us in a spirit of reverence. I was led to this church by a prayer. I had heard of Unitarian Universalism, and years ago, I took a religious identification survey online, and it listed Unitarian Universalism at the top of the list of religions that I would most likely identify with. But because I wasn't looking for a church to go to, it took me 10 more years to actually make it to the doorstep of a Unitarian church, and it was a prayer that brought me here. One day, uh, while I was at work, I noticed my legal assistant had uh, something taped to her computer, and it was this prayer that was printed out uh, on a little piece of paper. If you'll all open with me to the reading that's in your gray hymnals, 519. Yes. 
and read, we'll read the complete prayer together. So all the words we're going to read together. 519. Let me not pray to be sheltered from dangers, but to be fearless in facing them. Let me not beg for the stilling of my pain, but for the heart to conquer it. Let me not look for allies in life's battlefield, but to my own strength. Let me not crave an anxious fear to be saved, but hope for the patience to win my freedom. Grant me that I may not be a coward, feeling your mercy in my success alone, but let me find the grasp of your hand in my failure. Here was a prayer that gave expression to an understanding of prayer as an act which challenges, well, sorry, which changes not God or the world, but the person doing the praying. And the last line makes space for this inexplicable but undeniable experience of grace. I tracked this prayer down and learned that it was written by uh, Rabindra, Rabindranath Tagore, a Bengali poet, and was republished in our gray hymnal. And I was instantly curious about a church that would embrace this kind of a prayer. Eventually, I located First Unitarian Church of Hobart, and I think it may be possible that I would never have actually made it here if it hadn't been for that prayer. Please join me now in our opening hymn, number 348, Guide My Feet, 348, in your gray hymnal. Uh, please stand as you're able and willing. <laughs> Please remain standing and join me now in our affirmation of faith. The words are printed on the laminated handouts in your pews and in your orders of service. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament. Service is its prayer. And this is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Please remain standing. While we are striving to create a worship space uh, that is both spiritual and safe, we recognize that not everyone can attend in person, and we extend a special welcome to those who are attending virtually with us. Thank you to our tech team for making live stream and recording possible. 
due to COVID, uh, we, the greet your neighbor portion of our service will be contactless. So take a moment to greet your neighbor by waving your hands, bowing, and letting your smile reach past your mask to your eyes. be seated. Thank you. This, con this congregation expresses our greatest joys and deepest sorrows in community. We believe that a joy is magnified and a sorrow is diminished when they are shared. Please, we pause listening to what rises with, from within our hearts. Your joys and sorrows will not be streamed online, nor will they be part of the recording which is made public. Due to COVID, we're not passing the microphone, so please speak loudly when you share your joys and concerns. And if you cannot hear a speaker, please raise your hand. These joys and sorrows and hold them in our hearts, including those which are too tender to share aloud. I was coming here about, oh yeah, that's a lot louder. <laughs> I'm Kati Halstead. I've been coming here since I was about seven or eight years old, and around that time is when my dad started introducing us to spirituality, and one of the ways that he did that was definitely through prayer. Prayer was a big part of our family. We would do it early in the morning before we left for school. We would have a prayer when we were going to have a family dinner. I mean, we weren't, we weren't the greatest at keeping those routines, but prayer was a big part of our family. And another way that we included prayer in our routines was um, every night my dad and I would say goodnight, and he'd sit on my bed, and we'd do a prayer together. And I'd like to read that out to you all, and then afterwards, I invite that you all do it with me a second time. So it goes like, now I lay me down to sleep and float into goddesses dreamy deep. For my life, my thanks I give, to love this world, for this I live. When I wake in the morning light, may goddess be with me and guide my sight. Deep peace of the rolling wave to you, deep peace of the blowing breeze. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars. Deep peace of the white moon to you, deep peace of the gentle night, deep peace, deep peace, deep peace to you. Okay, now, all together. Now I lay me down to sleep and float into goddesses dreamy deep. For my life, my thanks I give to love this world, for this I live. When I wake in the morning light, may goddess be with me and guide my sight. Deep peace of the rolling wave to you. Deep peace of the blowing breeze. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars. Deep peace of the white moon to you. Deep peace of the gentle night. Deep peace, deep peace, deep peace to you. Thank you.
The reading today is adapted from Anne Lamont's 2012 book, Hope, Thanks, Wow. Lamont writes that those are the three basic prayers. Hope, thanks, wow. What do I mean when I use the word prayer? Prayer is a communication from the heart to which surpasses understanding. For convenience, you can say prayer is communication from one's heart to God. Or if that is too triggering or ludicrous a concept, then let's say it's a cry from deep within to life or love with capital L's. Let's not get bogged down on who or what we pray to. Nothing could matter less than what we call that thing which we cry out in our pain and our joy. Let's just say prayer is a communication to something that we can't define and we don't need to define. I do not know much about God and prayer, but over the past 25 years, I have come to believe that there's something to be said about keeping prayer simple. Wow, thanks, help. Sometimes the first time we pray, we cry out in the deepest desperation, God help me. This is a great prayer, as we are then at our absolutely most degraded and in isolated, which means we are nice and juicy with the consequences of our best thinking and are thus possibly teachable. For many years after leaving Christianity, I simply did not pray. In fact, I refused. Even when I felt guilty enough to join my wife, Ruth, and my uh, son and daughter, who were still Christian, as she led them in prayer in the mornings, like Katya talked about, I refused to get on my knees. I would obstinately sit on a chair or on the ground, but never kneel. This sign of submission still had power over me even 15 years after I stopped believing in a God who demanded submission. After I left Christianity, I began identifying as an atheist pagan, and I could talk for more time than we have about what that means, but <laughs> suffice it to say that if there were any kind of God I believed in, it would be nature. And nature was not answering anyone's call, as far as I could tell, so I saw no reason to pick up the phone. <laughs> Even when I created rituals for my personal spiritual practice, I did not make petitionary prayer asking for something part of my spiritual practice. I might stand on my altar at night and recite words that sounded a lot like a prayer, but I studiously avoided asking anyone for anything. My issue with petitionary prayer was uh, my belief that nature is incapable of answering prayers, at least not in the same way that an anthropomorphic God is supposed to. And to be honest, I looked down my nose at people who believed God heard and answered prayers. I just couldn't get around the idea that God would answer some prayers and not others. And the standard non-explanations for this, God works in mysterious ways, would inevitably set me off on a tirade for half an hour. I'm sorry to my family. <laughs> He's, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> After coming to First Unitarian of Hobart, I remember reading a story by the former UUA president, Bill Sinkberg, who is one of my favorite Unitarian Universalist thinkers. He talked about how he'd been called to the hospital one night when his son had overdosed. And as he sat by his son's hospital bed, he prayed. I am embarrassed to admit it now, but at the time, I felt contempt. I thought to myself, he was weak. It seemed like a betrayal of principles to me. And I thought to myself, if my child ever got seriously sick or hurt, I'd be damned if I prayed. Looking back, I can see that I was suffering from a profound lack of imagination. Clearly, I had trouble imagining what it would really feel like to have my child be seriously sick or hurt. When my son William was 16, the doctor told us that there was something, something on his spinal x-ray that might be a tumor. It was a week before the MRA results came back negative and we knew it wasn't a tumor and it wasn't anything to be concerned about. But it's not an exaggeration to say that hearing the word tumor in conjunction with one of my children 
was one of the worst moments of my life. Over that week, between the word tumor and the test result, negative, I contemplated all of the possibilities with lots of questions and no answers. I felt powerless and, uh, and out of control. The weight of it drove me to my knees, literally. I felt an emotional weight pressing down on me, a weight which I struggled against but finally acquiesced to. And I prayed. I didn't pray to any God who I believed would heal my son. I didn't even pray to a God who I believed was actively listening to me. But nevertheless, I had to pray. I had to kneel in acknowledgement of everything that was beyond my control. So I prayed to a personified, impersonal universe and said, my son may have a tumor. I don't want it to be true. I want him to be healthy and happy. I prayed not just not with any belief or even any hope that my prayer would change anything. I just knelt in acknowledgement of my powerlessness. I knelt in acknowledgement of all the things that I could not control, whether my son had a tumor, whether it would be malignant, even whether he would live or die. And then I bowed my head all the way to the ground three times. And then I got to my feet, because I wasn't done. I felt a sense of defiance rising in me, and I said to that same personified, impersonal universe that I knew I wasn't entirely powerless. There were things I could do. I could be with my son. I could ensure he received all the medical care he needed, and I could love him. Octavia Butler was the first acknowledged female science fiction writer and the first acknowledged black science fiction writer. Her dystopian novels, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, describe a fictional religion called Earthseed. And the first two tenets of Earthseed are God is change and shape God. For Butler, God is a metaphor for the ever-changing natural universe. To a certain extent, we are always at the mercy of forces which are beyond our control. But we have a measure of free will, the ability to perceive and learn and to become shapers of those forces. Our lives are the outcome of a reciprocal interplay between God shaping us and us shaping God. In one of the verses of Earthseed scripture, Butler writes, we do not worship God. We perceive and attend to God. We learn from God. With forethought and thought, we shape God, and in the end, we yield to God. And again, this God is not an anthropomorphic God, but it's the natural world. This is how I felt when I was driven to prayer by fear for my son's health. The feeling of both being shaped by forces I could not control and defiantly trying to shape those forces. And I found comfort and a sense of empowerment in this double-sided prayer. A friend of mine, M.J. Lee, once described petitionary prayer as an acknowledgment of the limitations of human action and will. She wrote, I don't think nature can hear us or choose to answer, answer or ignore our prayers, but I wonder if a prayer might make us more open to grace more aware and appreciative of when it touches our lives. This wasn't the first, uh, this wasn't the last time, it wasn't the first time either, that I was driven to my knees. A few years ago, I felt like I was running up against an, uh, an invisible limit in my life, in my environmental activism, in my closest relationships, and even in my internal state, I was feeling this limit. It was the limit of my ability to reason through a problem. For my whole life, up until then, I was confident in my ability to think and talk my way through any problem. And thinking and talking had always brought clarity to me. But when I hit this limit, talking no longer seemed to help and actually seemed to make it worse sometimes. And even thinking about it often made it worse. I felt like I was in a pit, and my reason normally would have been like a metaphorical ladder or, or even a rope to climb out of this pit. But now my reason had become a pickaxe or a shovel, 
and I felt like I was just digging myself deeper. I felt powerless and bereft of resources. I experienced depression and anxiety, which was something that was new to me. Eventually, I realized I couldn't think my way out of my pit. I had to feel my way through it. And that was awkward and embarrassing, and it felt a lot like walking through a dark room and stumbling around a lot. When it got really bad, I prayed. Not a wordy prayer, just a barely articulate, please help me. I wasn't even praying to anyone in particular. I was just sending that plea out there. And you know what? It helped. Some strength came to me. The knots inside of me seemed to loosen a little, not suddenly or dramatically, but definitely. It came from inside of me, I thought, but honestly, I don't care where it come, came from. I didn't care where it came from because it was keeping me alive. And I keep praying occasionally, honestly, mostly at my worst moments. I pray not to the God of my understanding, as they say in AA, but to the God of my not understanding. I decided I wasn't going to worry about trying to understand it for a while. While praying seemed inconsistent with my atheism, I decided it would be irrational, as well as potentially suicidal in my case, not to acknowledge the limits of my reason. One of my favorite books is by the 19th century minister John Trevor. His spiritual autobiography is titled My Quest for God. Trevor studied at Meadville um, University and was a Unitarian for a while. And what he wrote about Unitarianism has stayed with me over the years. My respect for individual Unitarians is unbounded, he said. And yet their religious position as a denomination is one which I have always regretted. For want of something I know not what, all their freedom... All their knowledge, all their generosity, all their high personal character, everything which seems to mark them out as the one denomination to lead the van of religious and social emancipation never comes to the point of making them a great reforming power. There is one thing needful to Unitarians. God alone knows what it is, but he does not tell them. Is it for their want of asking? Is it for our want of asking? Unitarians today tend to be even more atheistic than in Trevor's time, and so the notion of asking God for anything hardly makes sense for many of us. Anne Lamott says there's three basic prayers, wow, thanks, and help. All with exclamation points, I think. Some Christian writers have added a fourth, oops, But I think oops is a subspecies of help. Oops, I messed up. Please help me make it right. Oops, I messed up. Please save me from the consequences of my actions. Please let me find compassion in the eyes of others. Help, help. Of these three prayers, I think we Unitarians are probably most comfortable with the first one, wow, and least comfortable with the last one, help. And yet I wonder if we're cutting ourselves off from an important spiritual resource when we don't ask for help. We assume, naturally, that asking presupposes a sentient listener on the other end. Is that really true? Is it necessary to believe the natural universe is sentient in order to address a question or a plea to it, or even to receive a response? Asking is an act of humility. It's an acknowledgement that we don't have all the answers or all the power, and sometimes human reason and human will are insufficient. The Unitarian minister, Ashley Horan, who has been a facilitator at our church here, describes supplication, which is the act of asking or prayer, in this way. Opening ourselves to the ability to surrender control while courting creativity and cultivating hope 
as we seek to change circumstances in our lives and our world. The act of asking changes the person doing the asking. It opens us up to new possibilities. Perhaps asking is a way of quieting the conscious mind and allowing the unconscious to speak to us. Or perhaps it's a way of opening our senses to answers that are already around us, just waiting to be noticed. There doesn't need to be anything metaphysical about it. Whatever the mechanism at work, I know from experiences that answers do come when I humble myself enough to ask, which honestly is not very often. And grace did come when I was humble enough to receive it. I've received responses when I was Christian, and I believe they came from God. I received responses as an atheist, and I said they came from my deep self, but the effect was the same. This practice, the practice of asking, has worked most effectively for me when I set aside some time to do it, and when I vocalize my question or my plea, in other words, when it sounds like prayer. The vocalization might be the hardest part for many of us Unitarian Universalists, for many of us Anything that smacks of theism or belief in God triggers our intellectual gag reflex. But we might think of it instead as a spiritual technology which can be borrowed from theistic religions and made to work in a non-theistic context. You can rationalize this practice in any way you want, but I think for it to work, you have to really mean it. You have to really ask. You have to open yourself up to some kind of to receiving some kind of response. It could be anything from a resonant thought in your head that pops into your mind, to a synchronistic event, something that you notice that's coincidental, to just a feeling of relief or comfort that comes from somewhere. You can think of it in any way you want, but however we think about it, we have to quiet that nagging critical voice in our heads so that we can just ask. Just ask. Do we have someone to take our offering, to help take the offering? Okay. Um, I'm looking for the offering words. service for our offering. We give to remind ourselves of how many gifts we have to offer. We give to remember that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We give because we believe in music and sacred space. We give with the faith that together we have enough. There's an online link on, this, uh, on the screen for those who are remote for one-time and regular donations, and you can also contribute by putting paper money and loose change in these baskets and cups. The money in the cups goes to our Faith in Action Committee and a different charity chosen by the committee every month. This month's charity is... This December is the uh, Register of Discretionary Funds, which is used for people who come show up at the church for the first dozen years. Thank you. And please try not to touch the baskets or cups as the ushers bring them to you. Thank you.
thank you for your prayers, your presence, your service, and your gifts. We are truly grateful. The song Kum, Kumbaya, or Come By Here, began as an African-American spiritual known to be sung by some of the people who were enslaved in the American South. It became a standard campfire song at scouting and summer camps and was further popularized by the American folk music revival in the 1950s and the 1960s, especially Joan Baez's 1962 recording of the song. It eventually became associated with the Civil Rights Movement, and there's even a recording of marchers singing Come By Here during the 1965 Selma, Alabama March. In my lifetime, Kumbaya has taken on a ne negative connotation. It's invoked by politicians who disdain any non-militaristic response to conflict. But the song was originally an appeal to God to come and help those in need. Please join us in singing hymn number 401, Kumbaya, Come By Here, Rise As You Are Able and Willing. Number 401. Please be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> so people collect all kinds of things. One of the things I collect is prayers for atheists. <laughs> prayers that atheists might feel comfortable praying. 
This is one of my favorites and also one of the hardest to hear. For closing words, um, our closing words come from an interview by Krista Tippett of uh, the NPR show On Being of Ellie Weisel. Uh, you can also find this interview, you find this interview online and also in uh, Krista Tippett's book, Speaking of Faith. Ellie Weisel is a concentration camp survivor and the author of Night, most famously. He wrote this prayer in a journal and later republished it in his book, One Generation After. You can hear Weisel read it in Tippett's audiobook or Tippett's interview of him, and I highly recommend listening to audio, which is what we're going to do. This is a prayer of a man who has witnessed unspeakable horrors, a man whose most famous work is often cited as evidence for the death of God, and who put God on trial in his own writings. But it's also the prayer of a man with a deep sense that our conversation with God should not end there.
service and on the laminated handouts in your pews. We extinguish this flame, but not light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you all. <laughs> 